The Game of Zen explores the often overlooked ways in which professional, personal. What's happening? I don't know. It's just, I. It, you know what? It's starting, when I hit the, the intro, it's starting late. Uh, hold on. I think, Paul, I think you maybe, can you try it from your end? It might be my slow computer because when I hit the intro button, there's like a lag and that's mm -hmm. why we're on time. Um, actually, I don't see the controls. I think I need to log in. You in hit brand. Yeah. yeah, I don't see that, that sidebar. Um, I think I need to log in. So excuse me a second. I might end up jumping off. I'll jump, jump back. Okay. In. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, I think, you know, my slow computer, I, you know, because there's basically a button when we hit our intro and it just started late because mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's the slow machine, unfortunately. And it's still recording. It still says recording. Yeah, I know. Okay. We're gonna, we yeah. can edit it. We'll edit. Cool. Yeah. If we have to start over again, I'll have to create a new studio, but we, we can edit this out. Okay. I actually had to cancel. Paul and I were supposed to record about a week ago, one of our episodes. And like that morning, my computer like just started making all sorts of weird noises. And oh. I had to take it in and I had to cancel out on on the recording because I couldn't do it. Yeah. Now I have a backup machine, but it's not quite there. Mm. <laughs> it's never a good time for these things to happen. I know, <laughs> I know. Well, at least I have my phone and my, my tablet so I can get yeah. a lot of work done. But yeah. It's definitely throws you off a little. Hello. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to put, um, there we go. I just reorganized. So Aneta's in our upper right. Uh, okay. I think that's a good place to have her. Okay. You okay. could just start the intro whenever you're ready because we're recording. Oh, okay. And we'll add it later. Otherwise we'd have to redo the room. Yeah. And you'll jump in after the uh, after the uh, intro, or do you want me yeah. to jump in with the? No, I'll jump in and say hello after the intro. Okay, very good. <clears throat> the game of Zen explores the often overlooked ways in which professional, personal, and spiritual growth are interrelated. We dive deep into the life teachings of the Buddha and the mindfulness practices of Zen revealing how they can help us dramatically expand our possibilities for wholehearted work, life, and play. Welcome to a new episode of the Game of Zen podcast. This is Scott Berman checking in from Philadelphia, PA. And as usual, I'm here with my good friend, Sensei Paul. How are you doing today, Paul? I'm doing really well here in Boulder. Good to be here with you. Nice. And uh, we are honored to have a special guest today. And why don't you uh, do the intro? Yes. Our, our guest today is Aneta Ardelian Kuzma. Um, I've known Aneta for a few months. Uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend and just had a great deal of mutual respect and admiration for each other's work. So I'm, I'm really happy to have you here, Aneta. Aneta is a coach and a consultant, and she's the founder of the Ardelian Kuzma Group. Um, she's a former bank executive, and she now works with professionals and entrepreneurs to create mindful leadership, increase focus, creativity, and productivity, and deliver wellness programs to the organization. She had a successful 25-year career in banking, following which she founded her coaching and consulting business to help others, what she calls, live the width of their lives. And that's the name of her podcast. She's the host of a really wonderful podcast called Live the Width of Your Life. And she is the author of a book, Live the Width of Your Life, 365 Daily Meditations for Living with Purpose, Passion, and Peace. And all of those are subjects very dear to our heart. So we're really happy to have you here, Annetta, for a chat. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Paul and Scott. Very, very good. Very good. So 
Is it me first, Scott? Sure. You go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just work well together, don't we? Well, yeah, you know, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead, Scott. So, Annette, I'm, I, I find it really fascinating this, this transformation that you had in your life. Very few people go from high powered positions, um, particularly in industries like banking, which can be, you know, very aggressive and very, say, unmindful, perhaps, mm -hmm. in many ways. And you made a big shift and entered into a into a much more, I guess, rich and thriving path for yourself. So I'd love to hear you just talk about that transformation and what brought you to where you are now. Mm, yeah, it's such a big question. Um, I think my journey started probably before I even knew that I was on the journey. I don't know if that makes any sense. I felt like when I was a young mother working full time and raising kids, and I really um, spent so much time in daily yoga and meditation. I would wake up really early in the morning for my own practice in my kitchen while the kids were still asleep. My husband was still asleep and, you know, very early on. And I grew to really love that time of the morning. And it became really a thing that just kept me going. I think I wouldn't have been able to do what I was doing if I didn't have my daily practice. And I'm so grateful for that. And, but I never saw it as and career opportunity when I was in the midst of, you know, living the life that I was living. And I would say my first sort of awakening or a little bit of an aha moment was in grad school. So I was getting my MBA because that's what you did when you were in banking is you got your MBA. And so, um, I was in, um, a wonderful program. And we actually had a lot of classes on emotional intelligence and um, I had great classmates. So one of our assignments was to write a 20 page life vision um, for ourselves. And it was so hard. I mean, all the other work that we did, you could figure out how to write these papers, you can study, you could do all these things, but this was so um, introspective and reflective. And I hadn't done anything like that in so long. And I think that was the first, um, indication that like, Oh, wait a second. I don't think I want to retire from banking. Like, I don't know that this is really where I will be long-term and writing the paper was just an opportunity to dream, right? It's something that we don't typically do when you're in the middle of doing all of the things and there's very little balance. And so with that, it almost gave us permission that we had to dream, you know, 20 pages to fill. So it was an opportunity to really do some of that work. And I think that was the first time where I said, oh, okay, I think there's something, another chapter for me. I'm not sure when, but it will be coming later on. And um, when my kids started getting older, um, I finally felt like I could focus on myself again. I kind of put that on the shelf. I had it, you know, saved on my hard drive and, um, I hired a coach because I felt this like inner knowing that it was time to start to pick up this work again. And that's when I hired a coach and spent about six months with her really figuring out what do I want to do? What does this look like? Um, what is this next chapter of my life? And after I started that, I still stayed in banking for two years as I started working my little action plan and my vision, tiny little steps. And uh, when the time was right, I finally was like, okay, today's the day where I can actually make this, um, and leap of faith. And, uh, and then I haven't looked back ever since. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. That's fan fantastic. And by the way, pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us today. It's so great. good to meet you too. So I'm curious how you, over time, you developed th that in yourself, you developed the comfort level and then you decided, okay, I think I can help other people. How did you develop the skill set to help others after you had spent so much time working on yourself? Yeah, great question. So I um, I got a lot of certifications because I will tell you that when you're in an industry for so long and you've spent so much of your education and your experience and, and time working on it to make a big shift like that, there was a lot of inner critic. And so for me, it was really getting certified in life coaching, executive coaching, health and wellness coaching. I took classes on business coaching and also got certified to teach yoga and meditation and then breath work. And so for me, it was really important um, to make sure that I had the certifications and I had the experience before I 
could decide to say, okay, I feel comfortable starting to work with others. And so it was um, a couple of years it took to actually get all the certifications. And then of course, lots and lots of practice with coaching in order to get, you know, ICF um, um, certified, you have to go through a lot of coaching hours and get the experience and, and which is great because you start to build your craft, you start to feel more comfortable and you start to understand who you want to work with, where can I make the biggest impact and who are the people that I'm super passionate um, when I coach them. And so all of that has been a gift over the last, it's been five years now. Right. Great. And so you, I notice you also talk about creating like a culture of mindful leadership and wellness. Yeah. And um, how does that, how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. So it was during COVID where um, I really identified that many of my friends who are still in corporate were really struggling. I mean, all of us were struggling during the pandemic and with r routines were disrupted. Families were dealing with working from home, you know, educating their kids at home. It was just really hard. And so um, I saw an opportunity to really create some wellness programs for companies. And I did a lot of research to see what was really happening, talked to a lot of folks, did a lot of surveying of friends and family and um, contacted companies to say, here's, I think what people are going through. And um, I would love to come in and create a little program, like a little lunch and learn and bring in some meditation, bring in some breath work, um, sometimes some yoga. And um, people were open to it. And so it's been something now I've been doing since 2020. And through that, we've had, you know, CEOs of companies and, and senior leaders, as well as their teams on these sessions. And then many of them have continued on to be part of my community with my morning yoga and meditation class or attending breathwork sessions and some signed up to be coaching clients. So really through um, all of those programs, I've been able to help them in terms of being more mindful and then bringing that version of themselves to work, sort of integrating those practices into who they are and, and how they show up at work and at home. I, I'm so appreciative of how you're able to bridge, you know, these practices into that corporate world. And it, it very much comes from the fact that you you suffered in a certain way right. and you very <laughs> much connect with the way they're suffering and you've walked a certain path and now you can be a trailblazer to bring the practices back into that environment, but you do so with a ton of credibility. You know, you're not a, a kind of a woo woo, um, you know, yoga teacher who doesn't understand the, the context of that environment. You really bring it in. And I know we've, we've spoken on the side and you've had quite a bit of buy-in, you know, from leaders and rank and file of the organizations, right? To, to, to work yeah. with you, which is really wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, um, you, you talk about helping people recognize their limiting beliefs and behaviors and patterns that keep them stuck. And I think you do this in your one-on-one -on -one coaching work. So I'm, I'm curious, what are, if there are any common limiting patterns that you find amongst people these days, you know, in the constituency that, that you work with? Oh, sure. And even I don't have to look further than myself, right? I think we start and we look at ourselves first. And, you know, I stayed where I was for a long time because of fear. And there's this fear of, can I be successful? Will I fail? Can I make enough money, you know, to do what I want to do? I think fear is definitely something that keeps people stuck for a long time. And so I do a lot of work around fear and identifying what are these fears, owning it, naming them, helping people to then define what kind of a risk is this really? And, you know, being able to apply some critical thinking to some of these things and how can you minimize the fear? So those are, that's like a big one. And then um, this idea of imposter syndrome or inner critic. Um, I just did a video, a social media post. I was a little passionate about this because it is, um, it's incredible to me to see how many amazing, successful, intelligent, accomplished, qualified, credible people think that they're frauds and they're waiting for the shoe to drop and for people to think, to be able to say, oh yeah, you're not as smart as you think you are, or we thought you were, or you're not as capable. And it breaks my heart to be quite honest, because I think we take these labels on and it can keep us stuck. Or you can say, I feel this way, but let me change 
maybe the perspective on this, or let me really examine where these ideas come from Mm -hmm. and to shift that. And when I'm able to do that work in partnership with my clients, it's so gratifying because then you see people just flourish and blossom. And then they start taking action and doing the things that they want to do. But too often we hold ourselves um, in just this pattern of being stuck or, you know, fearful to move forward because of the limiting doubts and beliefs. Yeah, that's really great. And and I saw your your recent work on the imposter syndrome. It's really, really great. So sensitive and, and brilliant, really. Um, how do you work with the body on things like this? You know, we, mm. we have these, these beliefs and then ideas, and then you can see how they're not quite coherent or real. And we can visualize a new way of being or a new identity even. But you do a lot of body-based work with your yoga, your breath work, your meditation. Yeah. How do you integrate that into unwinding the fixed beliefs or the, the false mm-hmm. beliefs? Oh, gosh. You know, um, so all my coaching clients um, have my monthly wellness um, program as part of their package, which is every like six days a week, I do a little movement. So we do some yoga movement, stretching, moving, somatic movements, and then moving into a, I would say it's a it's it's a meditation plus breath work, something that I do that incorporates a lot of positive affirmations and good music. And so I really believe in the somatic healing. And we know that the body keeps the score to quote the book and that so much of the trauma or these limiting beliefs are really within the body. And so being able to start a practice where you bring forward an an intention and focusing in on that intention and bringing in breath, especially a couple of different breath patterns and whether it needs to be a relaxing breath or an activating breath, depending on the intention um, and guide people and really allow them to titrate in that experience has just been so helpful. When I discovered, um, I always did breath work as part of yoga for many, many years, but somatic breath work and is a little bit different and just being able to experience it for myself. I knew I had to get certified and to bring that into my coaching practice. And it has really been so transformative to so many clients because it's not just mindset work. It, it, It really is incorporating the body as well. And I just see that really amplifies the results. Superb. Do you, so when these executives come, when you first start working with them, are, do you think the limiting beliefs are based on what society thinks where they should be or what, you know, their friends and their, you know, their peers think they should be? And is it something that they, they work through internally and then they're more successful afterwards? You know, I, I do think societal norms have something to do with it. I think also uh, upbringing. It could be early childhood experiences. Um, we all have these um, saboteurs, right? The ways that we sabotage and some of our coping skills. So I think that we, over time, just accumulate these. And there have been so many amazing, like I said, executives I work with, wonderful people who maybe moved into a new role that was a little bit unfamiliar. And they're not used to feeling doubt perhaps, or maybe it just feels uncomfortable because they were in something that they'd mastered before. And instead of saying, well, of course it's natural for me to feel uncomfortable. I've not done this before, but I have all this experience that shows that I can figure this out, or there's a team of supportive people that could help me, et cetera. We don't tend to do that. Sometimes we go internally and we blame ourselves and we talk to ourselves and you know, the mind can be very, very deceiving (laughs) and then we can get ourselves in a really bad place. So I find that being able to acknowledge the thoughts, being able to recognize them, to state them, to name them and really help work through whatever it is, um, is very helpful. And then bringing in the somatic practices as well. But it really doesn't matter. I've worked with men and women who, and so I would say that it may play out a little bit different in um, in genders, but it really is something that is universal, these limiting doubts and beliefs. And um, the first key is just acknowledge that it's okay. Everyone feels this way and, um, and we can work through it. I want, I'm not going to let this hold me back and, and then just, um, you know, work through the work, do the work. I think that's great. You know, I found in organizations that I've been a part of, the more people that have that mentality, the better the overall team does, because then you're also supporting your teammates and about their limiting beliefs and you're encouraging them, you know, so you're giving them skills that can 
work throughout the entire organization. Yeah. And sometimes what happens is people find themselves in this way because they're not sleeping. They're not taking good care of themselves. And mm -hmm. so when we find ourselves in a very stressful state or burned out or in our sympathetic nervous system for so long, we're not able to think clearly, right? The front mm -hmm. part of our brain is actually turned off. It's offline. The amygdala is on. It's all lit up, the emotional mm -hmm. center of the brain. So sometimes just telling people it's not your fault that you're feeling this way. Let's just get you healthy. Let's focus in a little bit on taking better care of yourself. And then yeah. people will suddenly go, wow, I feel so much better. But, um, and who you are at home is who you are at work. And if you're not mm -hmm. feeling great, you're going to bring that version of yourself everywhere. You might, you might mm -hmm. do a better job covering it up at work, but then <laughs> your family might suffer, right? You, you come home and you've mm -hmm. got nothing left. And so I do see that companies are much more open to talking about things like burnout or stress yeah. or mental, um, mental health challenges that people are dealing with and they're open to new uh, modalities, which I think is beautiful. It really gives everyone permission to own their health in a way that maybe we weren't able to do before. Yeah. And that's a good segue into my next question about you mentioned passion and purpose yeah, and how important that is. So how does that play into your work and your yeah. personal life? You know, I just do a lot of visioning with my clients. I always tell them if you, you can, everyone has a to-do list, everyone has tasks they want to do, but if they're not tied to a vision, to your purpose, to your Dharma, you can spend your whole life busy, but doesn't mean you're going to go anywhere. You might just end up staying where you are and not find the satisfaction, the gratification. And so really doing the work on dreaming again, on visioning where you want to be is so important. And then when you work backwards, it's just so much easier to connect the dots and go, okay, I know what I'm going to do. And so I really stress that with all the clients, like we're going to do a little bit of work and I'll guide you through it and we'll see where we end up. And it's always amazing to see when people are relaxed and we sort of guide through this visioning, they'll say things and go, wow, I don't even know where that came from. I didn't know that that was even something that I was considering or that I wanted to do or you know, it could be a dream that they had before and they just forgot about it. So um, that's why I think it's so important. And then when you have a dream and you have a why or your ikigai, right, is it, you suddenly you lit up, you're lit up from the inside, you're excited and you're passionate. And then you want to do the things you want to take action, you want to start moving forward, you want to continue to grow. But if you don't have a strong why, it's really hard. It's hard to be resilient. It's hard to show up every day and do all these things. You know, Paul and I talked about how do you balance it all? And it's like, well, when you love what you do, you just do, you just find a way. And so that's why I think the purpose comes first. And then you have the passion allowing along with it. And then the peace, of course, through all these other practices. Yeah. You know, once again, I'm just so respectful of this holistic approach that you take, which is centered on passion and purpose. And that, <clears throat> that can be the fuel for, you know, any vision, any, any life, right. Yeah. When it, when it is, uh, is juiced, you know, from that place, it's, it's really great. I, I want to ask you something that I, that I ask, um, my guests who are, um, our guests who are, who are, you know, working with a lot of people and they're, they're kind of out there, you know, working with people who are, um, themselves out there in the world, you know, doing big things and living mm -hmm. big lives. And I, and I wonder with, with, um, the conditions in the world today, you know, climate disruption, a lot of conflict, multinational conflict, um, you know, perhaps an unstable economy in a lot of ways, certainly mass layoffs over the last year, year, year or two, um, how, how are people doing? How do you think mm. people are doing and how are you, are, are you, are you optimistic or not? And what do, what do we need as a collective? What, what, what are you seeing in terms of the collective and in, in terms of how it is and what we need to move forward in the best way? Yeah, it's interesting. So I'm part of a mastermind. And so, um, with about 25 women that are I would call us all spiritual entrepreneurs, women who are seeking to do business and from a more feminine energy perspective, maybe grew up in the masculine energy space for a long time. And I'd say we're very optimistic and um, we do everything with from a place of love and from a place of um, service and from a place of joy and purpose. 
And so I find us to be very optimistic and focusing in on those things. I would say my clients, um, they also recognize that what they're doing isn't working. And so that's why I think they seek the help. And so the self-awareness is a critical piece, but there's still a lot of stress over external environments. There's external factors. And also everybody has something going on at home right now. A lot of people that I work with are, you know, probably in, um, they're in the, you know, 40 to 60 age range. And many of them are still taking care of kids and also taking care of parents who are getting older. And so there's a lot that we don't always see. We see the external mm-hmm. stuff, which is hard, mm-hmm. the, everything you mentioned, Paul. Mm-hmm. And then there's all the things that are at home that are hard for everyone as well. So I think that's why people are, um, at least my clients are, are open to trying something different and saying, I don't want to do this on my own anymore. And that's where I think the community is so important. Why I continue to have this teach six days a week, you know, at six 45 in the morning, because the community is so beautiful and critical and it helps lift people up. And it's wonderful to know you're not alone and you surround yourself with other people who are like-minded. So it's uh, it's a little bit of both. I know there was a long answer to your question, but I'm very optimistic. That that's great. I really appreciated all aspects of of your response and the, this part about the uh, the community. You know that you say it's yeah. it's essential, isn't it? I mean, nobody it can is. do this on our own. So we're naturally um, embedded within this you know collective mind, heart, mind, if you will. So we kind of have to do this. And I was just oh so thrilled when you described this twenty five women mastermind group yes. to be the, <laughs> the secret leaders. You know of our culture. I'm a big yes on that. I just. Yeah. Um, we we talked just before the show about the toxic masculine culture, and I was wondering if it was going to come up. And sure enough, I'm going to bring it up because yeah. it is um, uh, one of these adverse conditions that you know we are facing as a collective, and we we all have our parts, men and women, um, yeah. to work against that into more of the the care paradigm versus the cure paradigm, yeah. right? The service and the heart-based emotional intelligence versus a more um, aggressive intellectual kind of achievement oriented mindset. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative that there's people like you in collectives like that, that are kind of leading the way, perhaps even under the surface and visibly in, in some ways um, to affect a, a collective change. So mm-hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And also the, you know, we all, this is not a gender discussion. It really is men and women and actually all genders. We all have within us the masculine and feminine energies. And our goal is to try to find that balance within ourselves mm-hmm. where we are in flow and creativity and, and love and service and, and vision and all of that. And also aligned action and, you know, being able to couple those two things together and, we find that by doing the things that we do and showing up for ourselves and meditating every day and doing the work. And, um, I do, I'm fascinated by this idea of energetics of organizations. And I think I'm just starting to see a little bit of people starting to talk about it, but you know, as we look at the distorted, as you mentioned, distorted masculine, we can think of a lot of industries where it's a distorted masculine energy, maybe the command and control leadership style that is pressed down and causes a lot of fear or stress on people. I do think that has to shift. I don't think that that is sustained. I think that industries will fail if they don't address it. And that requires all leaders but I am also concerned at the number of women who are leaving corporate because they don't feel they can influence the change from within and that they do have to leave and do something externally like me, you know? And so, uh, that probably is something at some point that we're going to start to see more and more discussed and hopefully there will be some changes. I feel like we've made progress in that department over the years. We still have more of a long way to go. I do think women are better at balancing that so many times in the workplace and men as far as balance goes. Um, but I think men are, we're getting a little better <laughs> over time, hopefully. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the, the pandemic and the effects. And I think it'll be years before we fully know from all, everyone was affected in one way or another. Yeah. And I find it interesting that during that, that period is when you sort of really started a lot of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, it was the time that I met Paul originally and started working with him. And it was a you know change period for me. 
How do you think the COVID the whole thing really affected us then and going forward? Mm, well, what I saw was um, fear. I think we had a collective fear um, and anxiety that was really, um, you could feel it, right? You could feel that energy. Um, people's whole routines were disrupted. I think that there was a lot of struggle initially with the disruption of routines and that caused people some angst. Um, the other thing that I'm seeing is something called cognitive overload, which is where people started working from home and or in hybrid environments. And they were, it's this always on mentality where you were at home and sitting in front of your you know, computer or your phone is on and people can get a hold of you 24 seven. So we started to not really have very good boundaries or delineations between work and personal. And um, that really started to cause um, some overload and some challenges that we were seeing. But on the positive side, people started incorporating healthier habits. People started walking their dogs at lunchtime. They started cooking from home more. They were spending more time eating as a family. They were spending more time maybe exercising and doing things that they couldn't do before. Maybe they could go to a class, a yoga class, et cetera. So I saw some of the positives. And then of course the pendulum swung and some offices and companies were saying, you have to come back to the office and people yeah. were struggling going, now, what do I do? And some people chose not to go back because they said, well, I'll just work somewhere else that allows me and gives me the opportunity to do what I need to do because they started tasting a little bit of that balance and creating yeah. something different. So I still think there we'll see, continue to see more and more of the impact and the effects, but you know, there was challenges, but then I saw, I thought people were super resilient and they started defining what they wanted to do in terms of how they wanted to live their life, which was actually a really good thing too. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of positives too, amongst all mm -hmm. the tough, hard times. Uh, yeah. I was curious, I was reading on your site about the mental health awareness month and you had a great post about like 10 things uh, about it. And so what, how did that come about? And, you know, um, can you elaborate on the, on what you need to do for your, for all of our mental health? Oh my gosh. I, that was probably from a while ago, Scott, you probably are more familiar with what I wrote than even I remember, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was just, it was just what I was seeing with my clients at the time. And so it was looking at what are my seeing with my clients? What are things that we can do? And just from a sense of empowerment to say that you can do certain things to impact your mental health right now. And I don't remember exactly what my tips were, but I would tell someone today, you know, you can go outside before 10 a.m. and get some sunshine, and that feels really good. Start your day with some uh, strong morning routines where you can focus on nurturing yourself mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. What does that look like? You know, don't look at your phone for an hour before um, you start your day so that you can set it with intention. I know, Paul, you love talking about intention. It's so important. Um, scheduling breaks throughout the day, which is really important. Our brains are not designed to stay turned on with full energy all the time. It's so important to do it. Eat your food mindfully, you know, eat yeah. healthy foods, incorporate all these things. And then even like sleep, our nighttime routines are so important. Millions of Americans are not sleeping enough and that impacts everything mm -hmm. else. So I would say it's one of the top pillars. So these are just very basic things that we can do within our own control to focus in on releasing some feel good hormones, doing meditation, yoga, breath work, moving into the parasympathetic nervous system, stimulating the vagus nerve, you know, all of those things. So I'm sure some of those were in that blog. Um, but yeah, that's the, those are some of the things that I would say we could do because I want people to feel like we can take control. We are resilient. We can take control of all the choices and the health, you know, the decisions and the habits that we have and just focus on 1% better. You don't have to do, you know, no. uh, radical changes, but just focus in on doing a little bit better every single day. I love it. Anetta, you work at these different scales, which is really amazing. You've got a breadth of, you know, um, capacity that that you can where you can meet people. Um, you you know, you do the organizational work and the cultural work and the collective work. And I and I, I wonder if you could say in a little bit more detail about how you do the one on one work. Um, mm. You've talked about helping them vision and find their passion and yeah. purpose. 
and all of all of the practices and vagus nerve and breath work that you bring in. What, what does it look like to work with you? Is it a you know a six week process? Is it a six month process? And how do you how do you? I, I'm sure it's depends a lot on the person and where they're at and what they're looking for. But maybe you could sketch out what that looks like for you generally. I'm curious. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I typically work with executives or entrepreneurs. Um, and I work with people who they tend to be type A, if I had a label, like they're the ones that are doing all the work, they're working really hard, but maybe they find themselves stuck or they identify that they have some specific goals. So when I first meet with someone for a coaching consultation, we identify, what are you looking to do? Why now? Why coaching? Are you coachable? You know, and are you open to this very holistic approach? Because if you're looking for just leadership training, I'm not your girl. Like, you know, we, I can refer you to so many other people, but um, I do believe it's important to, to look at all aspects of our life. And so once we identify kind of what it is that's most important to them, depending on how many goals they have or how many things they want to work through, then I create a proposal. And I typically do not work with folks for less than three months because typically it will take a while and I want to do some assessments and some other things. Um, and then I also have a six month program. And then some people have continued to work on with me for longer, just if we continue to work on new goals. But I would say either like a three or a six month and probably six month is more, um, is more common than anything else, five or six months. And uh, yeah, we spent some time initially really looking at assessments, identifying what are the things that make you you, what are the unique parts of you, what are some of the challenges, limiting thoughts, beliefs, things that could be keeping you stuck. And then working through redefining what does success look like to you? What are you even working towards? What would it look like for you to feel, you know, that you have a sense of purpose and passion and peace? And then we work through after we do some of that visioning, what that looks like. We create some really specific action plans and, and work through all of those things and, and work on accountability and, and check in. And of course, as I mentioned, the daily practice of showing up for the yoga and the meditation. And that I would say, I don't force people to do it. I of course don't. Some people can't from a time zone. So they have the recordings. However, the people who have the quickest and the most sustainable results are the people who really show up for themselves every single day in that way. Mm, brilliant. Strong work. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love the uh, name of your podcast, by the way, Live the Width of Your Life. Yeah. So how did that come about? How did, Tell us more about that title and how, we, how are we supposed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's from a Diane Ackerman quote, um, she talked about living the width of your life. And I remember the first time I heard it, I just, at the time I wasn't living the width of my life. I thought, yeah, too many of us are saying, you know, when I get there, when my bank account says this, when I lose 20 pounds, when I get promoted, whatever, we're always looking forward at a future date to be happy, to be, you know, find our, whatever it is that we're looking for. And then this idea of with saying, you know, we don't get to decide how many days we live as much as we'd like to try to control it. We can't, but what we can control is what we do with every single day that we do have, which is a gift. And so how do you live the width of every day? And I think that's mm -hmm. doing the work. That's being mindful. It's being present. It's knowing your purpose, your why it's, you know, making time for all of your values, the things that are most important to you, the people in your life, what, you know, why you're here, your purpose. And, um, I think that's, you know, the width for me and every single person that's been on my podcast, I ask them that question and everyone has their own unique definition of what that is. And that's one of the beautiful things too, because, um, that's what should be on our obituaries. Like we should be able to write our own obituaries and say, I live the width of my life and this is my life, what I did. Right. And if we did it right, once enough, once is enough. Although I think we have more chances, but once is enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so you, you talk about daily affirmations and what are some of your favorite, I know you have something for every day. Like what are some of your favorites that we should think about every day? Yeah. So my book is a daily. And so that gives people an opportunity with a quote and a snippet of a theme, and then also like a challenge or a journal prompt. But for myself and what I tell my clients all the time, I'm like, 
you are a miracle. You're in a one in 400 trillion miracle to be alive. Like that one is just when I always allow people to just sink in and just start really big. And I always say, you have the exact skills and gifts and talents that you need to make your dreams come true. And just going through like really big affirmations that remind you of your place in this world. Um, and I think those are more impactful than sometimes just focusing in on, you know, I always say I'm abundant, I'm limitless, all those other things too. But sometimes just starting with the miracle of just being alive just shifts perspective. And it's a great reminder for me. And, and then I have some, I've written some out for myself. So I'm, when I'm having a really bad day, I go and reread all the ones that I wrote specifically for me when I was having a good day. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. I think being alive is really great too. And yeah, it's something, you know, no matter what else happens, we're still here. It's good news. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And giving thanks like gratitude, yeah. right? Giving thanks for the breath in our lungs and our sound mind and our able body and these feet that carry us and just uh, water and fridge full of food and clothing mm -hmm. and shelter and a bed and comfy sock, like all of the things. Like, I just think that in addition to affirmations, like when we start with gratitude for all of the things that are, that is around us, as we look around, it's just it's overwhelmingly just you're so happy, right? So grateful. And uh, I feel like that's one of the best ways to shift perspective too. And, and I really like the bigness that you talk about mm -hmm. there, the, the, the bigness of the appreciation of the miracle. Yeah. And I think also the bigness of the, um, the invitation of the purpose and, yeah. the, and the passion, right? You're, yeah. You really want people to connect with their big, deep passions and, and big, deep purpose, you know, deep purposes that are more than just say a goal or a task, you know, yeah. for them to get to get done in their life, but to really live their biggest self. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I would like to express my gratitude for you to spending this time with us today. This is a, a really great conversation. And I think it just fits in very well with the message that we're trying to put out there to our listeners every week, you know, that it is connected your, your work life, your personal life, you know, your passion and purpose, the more that you feel comfortable about all that, the better you do in your career. Yeah, absolutely. We show up better in every area of life, every conversation, yeah. every interaction. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we, I, sorry, I want to jump in, Scott. We've got this metaphor of the game of Zen, which you could say is maybe a masculine sort of model because it's competitive, <laughs> right? It's got that. But but you've brought in this wonderful spirit of collaboration mm -hmm. and, and of depth that in our language, it is it is playing the game of Zen. And it's a spirit of playfulness and engagement with all the aspects of your life being deeply passionate. So it's right in line. And I too am very grateful and appreciative for you joining us today, Anetta. Oh, so grateful for both of you. I loved our conversation. Cool. And why don't you, uh, before we close it out, tell us how people can reach you and find your website and podcast. Sure. The easiest way, come on the website. It's anettakuzma.com, A-N-E-T-A. KUZMA.com. And you have access there to my book, to my website, to schedule a free coaching consultation, and also to sign up for classes. Like if people are on the fence and they're curious about the, what is this wellness bundle that you have, um, I offer a week for free for people to be able to sample it so they can join the morning yoga, the meditation, the weekly breath work sessions, just to get a flavor and a taste for it if they're curious with no obligation. And so um, I love to give people an opportunity to try some things and not feel like um, if it's not for them, it's okay. No problem. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you listeners for tuning in today to this new episode of the Game of Zen. We'll be back soon with more. Um, as usual, we ask you to subscribe and share wherever you get your podcasts and check out the Zen at Work newsletter and uh, contact Paul for more info. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks, Annetta. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us on this exploration into Zen Buddhism and its transformative influence on work and life. We hope you'll subscribe, share, and comment wherever you get your podcasts. May your journey be one of continuous growth and mindful living. From all of us here at Game of Zen, wishing you peace and prosperity on your path ahead.